Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. What a wonderful sense of stillness today. I invite you to say your name, which is our custom as we go around the room, and um, I invite you to leave some space to actually sense the stillness in saying our name. I'm Lynn. I'm Ernest. I'm Joe. My name is Gary. My name is Michael. I'm Carl. My name is Prasada Chitta. My name is Todd. My name is Ryan. I'm Monty. Dennis. My name is Ryan. I'm Jack. I am the Ricardo. Ricardo. My name is Ray. My name is Jared. My name is Waldo. My name is Jerry. I'm Clint. I'm Jim. I'm Zem. Baruch. Lee. I'm Pat. I'm Daniel. My name is Joe. <coughs> Peter. I'm Tom. I call myself Al. <laughs> George. I'm Risha. My name is David. Our speaker today is David Lewis who is familiar to the Sangha, since he's been doing uh, a wonderful four-part series on the four foundations of mindfulness. Today is part three, and it's the mindfulness of the mind. Uh, David has been following the Dharma path for 40 years and has a degree in comparative religious studies. He attended his first retreat in the Shambhala tradition at the age of 17, and has been practicing insight meditation since moving to San Francisco over 25 years ago. David teaches an insight meditation course at the Mission Dharma Sangha, led the Gay Buddhist Fellowship's 2013 Fall Retreat, and facilitates a weekly meditation group for seniors. He is a graduate of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center's Dedicated Practitioners Program. Welcome back again, David. Thank you, Lynn. <coughs> you have to shorten that bio. It makes me sound important. <laughs> so, um, as Len said, this is the third part in a four four part series on the four foundations of mindfulness, which um, is the translation for, uh, it's commonly what, what we call the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, Buddha's great teaching on, on mindfulness. And uh, four parts uh, aren't nearly enough to cover it. Uh, the great American meditation teacher Joseph Goldstein has um, a wonderful series of talks that you can find on dharmaseed.org about the Satipatthana Sutta, the same topic. Uh, and I think there's like 35 or 40 talks. So we can do all year. There's so much material in the sutta. The, um, in case you weren't here, or even if you were, as a fresher, the first foundation of mindfulness is the body. And the foundations of mindfulness is basically what we, can, what we do with our mind when we pay attention to our experience. It's also a description of our experience. Uh, so the first foundation is, is uh, mindfulness of the body. And if you no, go no further than that, 
if in your mindfulness practice, your meditation practice, you do nothing but pay attention to the body, you, you won't get far. Uh, the Buddha said that um, everything we need to know and everything that there is to be learned is contained in this fathom long body. The second foundation of mindfulness um, is feeling tones. The, the basic kind of primal quality for each one of us is different for each one of us of, of all experience being either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That's what we talked about last time. So those two, the first two foundations, the feeling tones and the body, um, are kind of precognitive activities. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the third foundation, which is mindfulness in the mind. And uh, we're getting into the cognitive aspect of what goes on with our mind um, and what comes up for us when we meditate, when we're mindful. Thoughts and also emotions and feelings and moods are all covered by the third foundation of mindfulness. I recently saw an um, interview with Sharon Salzberg, who's a, a really wonderful meditation teacher, and it was entitled, Nobody Fails at Meditation. And the point she was making is that um, it's not necessarily so important what we notice happening in the moment, in the present moment, as how we respond to that. And so that's kind of the way I want to view thoughts and feelings, how, how we respond to them. Um, in, her, in her interview, Sharon Salzberg was talking about um, the number of people that, that come to her and say, well, I can't meditate, or I failed at meditation, or it just it doesn't work for me. And she makes the very good point that that's basically impossible. That, that's like saying you're not able to be in the present moment. What people are generally referring to when they say that meditation is not working for them or is difficult for them and it's difficult for all of us at one time or another is that um, we tend to judge our experience. We don't like our experience um, oftentimes. We don't like what happens, what comes up when we um, uh, close our eyes and get quiet with our mind. I can't remember, did I, did I talk um, last time about this study that I heard about the psychologists doing where they asked people to be quiet with their mind, quiet with their thoughts? Um, just in a nutshell, um, a, recent, a, a psychologist did a research study and they asked a, a group of research um, subjects to be quiet with their thoughts. It wasn't suggesting they meditate, just be quiet with your thoughts and let us know how you like that. And um, more than half the people found it to be a very unpleasant experience. And they took the study one step further and said, well, are you willing to do this again, um, or will you give yourself a mild electric shock so you don't have to do it? <laughs> and most of the men in the study chose the electric shock, <laughs> rather than sitting quietly with their thoughts. So um, it's a beautiful description of dukkha. Of, of what we call suffering or, or discomfort is very often when we get quiet with our thoughts, um, we don't always like what comes up in our thoughts. That's the nature of dukkha. The Buddha said your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your thoughts, unguarded. So um, we're not talking about thoughts being bad. Or evil. We're talking about having a different relationship with our thoughts. Usually, um, in our everyday reactive life, when we, whether we're meditating or not meditating, when we have thoughts, we identify with them, or we deny them, or we judge them. And the Buddha taught in the in this particular sutta, the Buddha taught that those are all unskillful ways of relating to our thoughts that we should try to avoid identifying with thoughts, getting caught up in them, and also denying them and pushing them away, which is what so many people um, that haven't had any instruction in meditation think, they tell me that they think they're supposed to do in meditation is sit down and get rid of their thoughts, make them go away. Not skillful. So with training, and meditation does take some training, it's a skill-building activity, with training, we can learn how to 
develop a different relationship with our thoughts. We can accept them as conditioned, ephemeral, meaning changing, uh, phenomena. <coughs> Simply phenomena. Short-term visitors. I uh, uh, taught a uh, beginning meditation group for uh, seniors that's kind of become a sangha, but when, when it was a class, uh, we met in a um, at Shar uh, synagogue, and there was a construction project going on outside the synagogue. Uh, the whole eight weeks that we were doing the class, they were uh, tearing up the street outside. So there, there, when we were meditating, there were um, jackhammers going about half the time. So I used um, something that I'd never done before with beginning meditators. I used mindfulness of sound to... Um, to, to kind of try and get, a, get, get them started with mindfulness. And so that's what we work with for several weeks, with just mindfulness of sound, is how to let a sound be a sound without getting attached to it, without trying to make it go away or, or um, obsess about how unpleasant it is. It's just let it be. And um, it turned out to be kind of a, a, a wonderful way to teach meditation because by the time I got around to talking about thoughts, working with thoughts, um, one of this 80 year old man in the class put his hand up after a couple of sessions of talking to him he said I think I've got it I think I get it and I said what'd you get Larry and he said thoughts are just sounds in the head <laughs> so you know he knew how to work with sounds and by the time we got to thoughts he realized oh okay sounds are no different than thoughts they're just phenomena they're just sounds in the head Larry got it Joseph Goldstein says, notice how we build houses out of, our out of our stories and then inhabit them. Notice how we build houses out of our stories and inhabit them. That's what we do with our thoughts. Is we, we create a whole sense of self, a whole sense of, of reality, and then we move into that house. I think that's a paraphrase from a Rumi poem that I'm kind of vaguely remembering about um, tearing down the house that you've built. So um, a great meditation instruction to um, kind of put on the back burner and remember, and you can ask yourself this anytime you're meditating or not, a really wonderful meditation instruction is to ask yourself, what's going on and how am I responding to it? Just two, those two very simple things, what's going on and how am I responding to it? The Buddha points out in the sutta that um, he, he talks about um, the defilements. And I think you've all heard about the defilements. They're greed, aversion, and delusion. So the Buddha said in, in working with our thoughts, you might start by just simply noticing whether greed, aversion, and delusion are present or absent. Without judging it. Simply notice that they're present. So it's, it's I know it's Hard. Like when, say, aversion is up, or maybe anger, maybe you've got some anger going on. If we want to say, I'm angry, that's identifying with anger. Um, but in mindfulness practice, we tend to we try, try to use different language around that, encourage people to say, notice that anger, anger has arisen. Anger's here. It's just a passing phenomenon. It's not necessarily my anger, and it's not necessarily permanent. We don't have to identify with it. So um, it's another useful meditation instruction is to notice the presence or absence of greed, aversion, or delusion. Greed is, is desire, wanting things. Maybe just wanting something else to happen. When we're meditating, maybe we want to have more pleasant thoughts or we want to have a pleasant reverie or we want the bell to ring. Mm -hmm. It's all aspects of greed. Aversion includes um, ill will, but also <coughs> boredom or frustration. Wanting things to be other again, wanting things to be other than they are. A delusion is bewilderment, confusion, or doubt. So when we have um, unwholesome mind states, it's almost always one of those three. They can almost always one of those three. You can identify that. And when we have wholesome mind states, in the sutta we talk, uh, the Buddha talks about unwholesome wholesome mind states and wholesome mind states. Wholesome mind states are the absence of those. 
um, happiness, freedom, liberation. Um, we tend, especially us Westerners, to focus more on the unwholesome. We notice what's wrong, what we don't like, what we're uncomfortable with. Uh, but it's a very skillful thing uh, and quite a beautiful thing to notice the absence of those things. <coughs> When you don't have unwholesome mind states, it might seem neutral, but um, it might be the nature of mind that you're experiencing. So another way of putting that is to notice what leads to um, happiness or liberation, and what leads to suffering, in terms of what's going on with your with your own mind. So. Um, in the third foundation of mindfulness, the Buddha is suggesting that we do some investigation. And by investigation of what's going on in our mind, if our th with our thoughts, or our feelings, or our moods, the investigation doesn't mean thinking about thinking. Investigation means just noting thinking, and maybe noting how it feels in the body, noting what's, what's coming up, and how I respond to that. So, for instance, this morning during your meditation, perhaps, um, you might not have been aware of it, but maybe for somebody, boredom came on. And then maybe the thought came on that, that, oh, I shouldn't be bored, or I don't want to be bored, I want to be interested, I want to be engaged. So a judgment follows on, on that mood that arose. Um, there's nothing wrong with boredom coming up in meditation. All kinds of stuff comes up in meditation. Anger, frustration, happiness, peace, tranquility. Um, you name it, they're all passing phenomena. So if we can refrain from judging our experience, um, we might have a more skillful meditation. <clears throat> So that's the key, it's refraining from judgment. So I invite you in your meditation to, to um, play with this a little bit and reflect on what's wholesome and what's not wholesome without judging. It's a little bit of a challenge. Another thing that um, Joseph Goldstein um, just read one of his articles, so I'm quoting him a lot, um, points out is that the myriad problems of the world that we see in the newspaper every day are simply unwholesome mind states being acted out. So I wanted to talk a little bit, um, not just about thoughts, but also about moods and emotions, which are included with thoughts in this um, in this sutta. And it's an interesting reflection because um, I, I find it really interesting to explore how um, our moods affect our thoughts and how our thoughts affect our moods. They're just entwined so that it's, they're almost impossible to parse apart. If you're in a bad mood, um, that's going to reflect itself in your thoughts. Um, if you're in a grumpy mood, if you're hungover, if you're um, frustrated, um, uh, the world is going to be a little bit of a tougher place <coughs> to face. Um, and we internalize that. We think, okay, that's, that's my reality. And likewise, um, any given thought can throw yourself into a mood. It works both ways. If you, um, somebody pops into your head that you're having a problem with, um, that's going to create a mood. So um, emotions can be kind of an unconscious filter on our whole experience. Our whole experience of, of a day or an hour or, or a minute can be um, colored by our mood. So it's important not only to um, have a sense of wholesome and unwholesome thoughts, but what's going on with our mood. And also, if we cannot be judgmental about that and realize that it's just passing a phenomena, um, we won't personalize it. Difficult mind states are not a problem. They're simply passing a phenomena. And I talk a lot about mind states. Mind states include moods, emotions, thoughts. Um, 
pretty much anything that comes up when you're meditating is a mind state. They can be pleasant, they can be unpleasant, they can be neutral. So I know you've, um, most of you have heard this tool from me before, but um, I'm going to repeat it because it bears repeating and it's a really handy, um, I think, useful uh, tool for meditation practice. And that's the um, acronym of RAIN, R-A-I-N, for working with difficult thoughts. Um, the R stands for recognize. So say anger's up for you. First thing we do is recognize it. Oh, there's anger. Anger has arisen. If you can avoid saying, I'm angry, say, anger has arisen, um, it's useful. Just recognize it. Oh, there's anger. A, the A, R-A-I-N, A in the acronym, stands for accept. Like, okay, anger's arisen. I can live with that. It's just here. I'm not going to judge it. I trust that, like everything else, it's probably going to arise and go away, but it's here for the moment. The I in R-A-I-N is investigate it. And again, this doesn't mean think about it, but rather, how does this feel in my body? What's going on? What's anger like? Maybe it's a contraction in the body. Maybe it's heat. Maybe it's energy. I notice all these things when I, the day after elections, when I reread the paper. <laughs> contraction, there's heat, there's energy. There's even kind of a, a, a self-righteous kind of good feeling that's associated with it. Like, you know, I know better than they do. So investigation is how's it feel? And most importantly, the N in R-A-I-N is not identify. Don't identify with it. This is just anger arising. Anger happens. Or happiness arising. Or joy. Or peace. Ah, peace. How's that feel? Warm, opening, accept it, appreciate it, enjoy it. And know again that like anger, it's a passing phenomenon. So working with thoughts, whether they're difficult, especially difficult thoughts, whether they're difficult or not, recognize what's going on, accept it. It's, it's not our core um, habit is to accept difficult mind states. Investigate it. How's this feel in the body? What's the mood associated? How am I responding? It's another investigation. How am I responding to this? And not identify. Like, okay, this is just anger. It's not necessarily me or mine. The great um, Zen teacher, Dogen, famously said, probably everybody knows this quote, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. So that's what the Buddha's suggesting in the Satipatthana Sutta. It's a study of the self. Um, it's interesting to know that the first three uh, foundations of mindfulness that we've talked about so far, the body, feeling tones, and mindfulness of mind, are also the first three aggregates. Uh, aggregates are um, the four things that the Buddha said makes up ourself. You know, if you go looking for what actually makes up you as a self, as a being, there are four things. There's body, there's feeling tones, the response to the world, there's mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and there's consciousness. That's what makes us up. And if you parse all those things out, it's hard to find a solid self. It's always one of those four things. So, again, 
Um, Dogen says to study the Buddha is to study the self. That's what we're doing when we meditate. That's what we're doing with the Four Foundations. To study the self is to forget the self. To realize, oh, we're just a collection of aggregates. That's all we are. And to forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. It's to, that's tearing the house down and seeing uh, reality as it is. So um, that's what I have to say about the third foundation, and I was really hoping that we could have a little conversation about uh, uh, meditation. We don't do that often in, in, at GPF. Uh, either any questions you have about um, any of the foundations of mindfulness or questions or comments you have about your meditation practice. Clint? Can you distinguish mind and consciousness? Because to me, these this moments synonymous. Um, the way I understand consciousness, and there's, you, know, you might hear a different answer from every, from every teacher you talk to, but my, my understanding of consciousness is that it's a conditioned thing, as opposed to awareness, which is not necessarily a conditioned thing. But consciousness is a conditioned thing, like thoughts, which are conditioned things. Consciousness depends on, on having a mind, having um, a sense organ, like an eye, and having an object to look at. So I am conscious of you sitting there because I have an eye that can see you and your body is sitting there and I have a mind that brings those two things together. So it's, it's consciousness is um, dependent on, um, on a sensory object, a sense, a sense organ and an object. So consciousness could be described as sensory input? <clears throat> yes, and that includes the mind. The mind can be, um, the, the mind, the Buddha actually included the mind, the, the mind as a sensory organ. So if we had, you know, which is how thoughts can be just like sounds. So a thought depends on, on a mind that recognizes a thought. Shut to so besides sitting meditation, which is what we do here, uh, what other kinds of meditation uh, ways or techniques uh, or other kinds of meditations have you um, found useful and, and when and, and why? Uh, great question and a big one. Um, for me, uh, Mindfulness practice is, uh, is something that you can do all day, all the time. Um, it's not habitual to us. And so um, the, the Buddha sometimes used the, um, the, the metaphor of, of uh, learning how to play a musical instrument for meditation. That it, it takes some practice, it takes some instruction. So um, when we do sitting meditation, uh, we're basically um, intentionally practicing mindfulness. Um, it's, it's, it's like sitting down at the piano and, and playing scales. But um, once that becomes habit, habitual, that mindfulness spills over into daily life, and I'm sure a lot of you probably have, have, have noticed this in your own lives and your own practice, is the line between what we do sitting on the cushion and what we do in our mind um, consciously during the day is, becomes less distinguished. So mindfulness can happen off the cushion as well as on the cushion. Um, and also the Buddha said there's you know, four official postures for, uh, for practicing mindfulness, sitting, standing, walking, and, and lying down. So basically any, um, any posture your body is in is, is an appropriate posture for doing mindfulness. The, um I really appreciate your discussion of uh, what goes on in meditation, you know, where all thoughts are spinning around, some of which are more enticing than others, or you can get hooked into the next few steps uh, and, and then realize, oops, I'm too far down this, let me, let me get back and uh, detach from that. However, there is a lot of skill that gets used in daily life that uh, requires 
stringing together of thoughts. This is what's going on. What, how should I respond to it? And, and, and then plan the next step, couple of steps. You know, while you're doing that, of course, you know, you're caught up in the thoughts. And no, I, I, don't, I don't have a particular specific question, but there, there is this dichotomy. You know, there are times when to, uh, to let go, and other times that it's necessary, even in responding to an stimulus, like coming up of anger, and I certainly have you know, had recent experiences <laughs> with that, that uh, came as a result of trying to put together a lot of information and, and supervising other people, helping you know, that, you know, make that happen. You see what I mean? There's uh, anger can arise when you see things going awry. Yeah, and how, how do you solve, you know, without stringing together those thoughts, you really cannot respond skillfully. Well, that's stringing together thoughts and problem solving is a is a skillful use of mind. We need it to 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 get by in everyday life, as you're as you're so beautifully describing. So, um, essentially, there's an aspect of that. As, as I'm saying, that's how we how we can work with meditation is is to work skillfully with the mind as well. So, um, again, thinking isn't the enemy. Thinking can be can be very useful. But, for instance, um, you, you use the example of anger, and I use the example of anger. That's a, a, a great example of, during, in the course of your working day um, at the job, if anger comes up, or if you're at a meeting or something, and, and your buttons get pushed, it's a really useful skill to notice that that's happened. Oh, you know, anger's been triggered. If, if you're aware of that happening, to see it happening, then you can skillfully say, well, I'm not going to act on that. I'm just going to notice that anger's up. You know, I'm sitting in this meeting and somebody's pissing me off. Um, if you don't, if you're just completely reactive, if you're not aware of anger coming up, then chances are you're going to act out on it and, and it'll make your day a little bit more difficult, maybe. So that's a good example of how mindfulness can can be useful in everyday life. We actually notice what's going on and, and make choices rather than being reactive. David. Uh, thanks, David. Um, I'm going to ask about in the RAI and the I investigation, is, is it ever useful to, let's say there's anger or fear and you still notice it in your, in your body as part of the I. How about looking at thoughts that are, are fueling like anger or fear or, or even kind of noticing what type of difficult emotions or reactions you have a tendency to have in your life. Really skillful thing to do. I mean, that, that's, um, that's one of the things we try to do in mindfulness practice and it's also one of the things that we learn how to do in therapy, in, in Western therapy is notice what our patterns are. It's just, it's so great to notice, um, the, the Buddha called them sankharas, or, or, or thoughts, or habitual patterns, um, many of which are, we, we tend to be judgmental about, but they're not our fault. It's, it's what we got taught as children, it's the culture, it's, it's growing up gay in a straight world, you know, all these impacts um, on, our, on, our, on our life and our mind um, make up of how we respond to the world. And so being able to recognize those um, is really useful. And also, if we're able to non-identify the end, non-identify, um, then we don't get so caught up with them. It's like, oh, okay, there's that old pattern of mine. I recognize that. I know how it feels. Maybe I feel, maybe I've got a, a habitual pattern of thinking that I'm not good enough, um, which I learned somewhere in early childhood, that I'm not, I'm not good enough to be sitting up here giving a Dharma talk. But um, I could just recognize that and think, well, is that true? Or is that just a habitual thought? Is that just a pattern? So, I'm, great question. I'm glad you pointed that out. And, I'm feeling there's a little dance around this um, thought connection to emotion, a connection to anger, where we don't identify with the thought, we should identify with the anger, and yet 
the positive side of maybe one person represses anger, and the, and the anger to notice is, I need to do something rather than not do something, like Hamlet. You can stay in inaction by constantly being mindful of the mind. And then there's sometimes that there is a time when it's one's investigation of the self that says, I must act. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to be notice of what the anger is telling you is going on in you to be able to act, as well as to not react. Right. Not react from the anger, but to act from the self that needs to do something in order to continue the next step. So I, 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 I hear a little bit of the anger, the negativity of anger, and in my life, there's a little bit of positivity of anger that needed to be, needs to be, but also balanced, but also to be recognized, accepted, and uh, utilized. Well, and <coughs> indeed, sometimes anger is a, is a great motivator. Um, but the the Buddha's encouraging in the in the third foundation is to look at its wholesome qualities and its unwholesome qualities and to make choices. So I, I don't mean to sound like I'm saying don't act, um, but act right. based on based on skillful choices, based on wholesome um, mind states. Cool. Does that help? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have something to throw in about that? Sure. Joe? Yeah, well, it's, it's a little bit of... It's, it, it's definitely in the feeling realm. You know, anger has a strong emotional feeling. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, the challenge with this whole Buddhist path is I don't want to uh, use it as an inoculation for not feeling things. You know, or just being level like this all the time. And... Uh, and most of the time, I feel pretty good, you know. And like, like last night, I had some inner exchange, and I was feeling it was a really big disappointment. And I was like amazed at the emotion that I felt. And like, there's part of me that wanted to, you know, get away from it. I, I noticed that I wanted to like turn on HBO, and I noticed I wanted to have the urine. I sort of negotiated with myself, but I also just realized. There is a plain quality of, of disappointment that I needed just to hold and um, and just be okay with that. Um, and maybe, uh, what's, what was the end uh, that you said? Non identify. Yeah, I mean, it, it felt real, but I also knew this would pass. Um, but I think, you know, 20 years ago, I would have done everything I could to distract myself from that feeling. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I, I also don't want to, I, uh, I don't want to just like neutralize everything. Yeah, beautiful. That's a beautiful way of putting it. And and that's not what we're suggesting. I don't, that's not what the Buddha's suggesting. Is, is, you know, do feel your feelings deeply, but notice what their nature is. Notice notice how they feel in the body, and notice their changing quality. Um, when we say, I'm angry, um, that's kind of a solidification and a, and a, and a reification of anger that, that can make it last a whole lot longer than it might normally otherwise do. Um, so, uh, yeah, notice your feeling. That's why I'm, I'm trying to um, encourage especially this non-judgmental aspect of looking at our experience and saying, okay, that's, you know, Right now, I'm disappointed. Disappointment feels like this. It's unpleasant. Disappointment feels like this. And it's um, the result of causes and conditions. Um, sometimes it's helpful to say, you know, this will be temporary, it's going to go away. But you know, sometimes you just have to feel it. So thank you for reminding me of that. I just wanted to add on to the last two comments, because uh, both of them. <laughs> Uh, help clarify what I was trying to say uh, to uh, to comment to the beginning, and uh, what Lynn said about, in particular, anger as a call to action. 
Well, that would be a skillful response. I mean, I, I think it's totally consistent with the you know, the rain now uh, analogy because you're not identifying with it. You're totally saying, "I am angry." That hurts me, but it's something that that you're still fully experiencing and occasionally it should lead you to take some positive action to address that skillful action. Yeah. Which not responding would not be skillful, or not just uh, be too yeah. passive. So. And it doesn't necessarily need to be anger, as we can, you know, hear about an injustice in the world and know with, with, with wise discernment that that's wrong. Rape, war, you know, whatever, the destruction of the ecosystem, that's wrong, and take action. Um, but it, that doesn't necessarily require anger. We might get angry about it, but we can take very wise action, skillful action, without necessarily being angry about it. And that's why you hear no great quotes coming to my head, I wish they were, but people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, and the Dalai Lama talking about, um, the Dalai, well, okay, here's an example. The Dalai Lama, when asked about the, the, the Chinese invading Tibet, said, I, I will not get angry about that because that only fuels the same um, cycle of, of, of hate and oppression that, um, that is already happening. The Dalai Lama said, I will not be angry about that, and yet I will work towards uh, liberation of the Tibetan people. But it, it takes quite a person to, 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 to face that kind of injustice in their own life and, and not get angry about it. Yes? Thank you for your talk. And um, I like the, I appreciate the analogy of sounds, and the idea that I don't have to identify with them. Um, something that's been happening for me is uh, November 1st was a year since I se separated from my partner. And so I keep saying, people ask me, how are you doing? Or it's on my mind, so I, I, I say I'm sad. But the truth is I'm not necessarily all the way sad. You know, like, I'm also very happy, I'm also grateful, I'm also, um, yeah. you know, entertained, I'm also all these things, all these sounds, are, I'm going to start using that, the sounds, you know, because um, I, can, I can be all those things, that's the human paradox, I can be all those things at once, I can have, yeah. really, I can be giggling and laughing and silly yeah. with my kids in kindergarten, and then I can think of my partner and feel all the way with sadness, I can look at the moon and say, God, it's full moon tonight. And then I can think, oh, I wish I had a romantic partner to share. You know, it's like, I, it's all these different sounds. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I'm going to use that a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah when, when somebody says, how are you? It's a, that's a pretty complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I usually am kind of struck dumb when somebody says, how are you? And, Okay, you know, it's, it's easiest to say fine <laughs> or okay, but, you know, actually there's a lot going on and I could talk for 20 minutes about how am I right this moment. That's a great example. Uh, to go back to the, I think it was a very early question that was asked about the nature of consciousness and you gave an explanation of it which seemed you know, quite, quite clear and, and that was fine, but I realize when when I'm thinking of consciousness, I suppose in terms of the terminology, I'm thinking more of awareness. And so, people often, consciousness, yeah. as you described it, is that, that's fine, that's easy enough. But I still am totally puzzled by the nature of awareness, and I I wonder if there's anything to be said about that, or does that fit into the category of questions the Buddha said, "Don't ask them." <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole nother Dharma talk, is what it is. Um, no, I don't think the Buddha said don't. He, he addressed it in all kinds of different ways, but it gets debated in the in the mindfulness world it, it, between the two different Buddhist traditions. Um, there are different ways of defining awareness and consciousness. Um, but as I said, in, in my tradition, the way I use it is awareness is something. Awareness is something that's always there and doesn't change, and it's not conditioned, it's not dependent on something. Awareness. Try, for example, to s stop being aware right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Try
Turn off your awareness. You can't do it, right? So awareness is, is always there. It doesn't age. Um, but consciousness is, is dependent on causes and conditions and sense organs. That's just my understanding, and people will give you, would give me an argument on that, I think. So it, it's a total mystery, yes. <laughs> but an interesting one. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Uh, Al. So, is awareness money? I don't know. I will not go out on a limb on that one. Is awareness <laughs> money? Some people would say yes. Um, some people would say it's the nature of mind. Mm. Is any opinions on that in the room? I've always been a dog person, and, uh, but I did have one cat that I really fell in love with. Uh, she lived in, she was part of my life for 13 years. With her, I became aware of cats and their presence in the world. Now, one of the things about cats is that very often you're walking down the street and you're being observed. There's awareness by a cat maybe hiding someplace <laughs> in one of those windows. Uh, and if you look around in an urban environment like this, it's likely to happen. And so, there's awareness there. That's I don't know what's inside of a brain of a cat. I don't know if there's a consciousness <laughs> to what level there. There's mindfulness there, but there's awareness, as far as I can tell. Yeah, so there, being observed. there are there are uh, uh, books written on this, from consciousness of, of animals. And we're we're still learning about it. It's how animals are different from us and how how they're a lot like us. Oh, you look like you have a follow-up. I just have one follow-up, follow up, which is, there I think we run into the limit of our sense, sensory apparatus in order to pass into greater realms. It may be that mountains are aware, and we have no way of sensing that. And I certainly feel that planets have some measure of awareness. So where does it stop? I don't think it ever stops. That is, uh, that is one of the great questions, and a really interesting one. Um, you could go either way with it. I just read an article not too long ago, something that I didn't know, that we have smell receptors, scent receptors on our skin. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> light receptors behind your knee. That's where Do we? Yeah, they, they found that that's where we sense the seasons. <laughs> so we shouldn't be wearing pants so much. <laughs> See, I, that's fascinating. This is fascinating <laughs> stuff. Yes, <laughs> That's really interesting. I'd like to go back to anger. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I did <you> so well. <laughs> look back at look back at anger as a play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, there, there's a lot about Christianity that, as an institution, I think is deeply flawed, more so than my experience of Buddhism. But but Jesus figure himself, I, I feel powerfully attracted to. Uh, maybe even more so than I do to the Buddha. Uh, and uh, example of him in the temple, you know, turning over the tables and throwing the money lenders out. Um, that was anger, but that was anger that I felt right on Jesus for doing that. Or, or, or there are times where he feels terrific grief, like like when his friend Lazarus dies, or in other examples too, or or a sense of despair when he feels like he's forsaken when he's on the cross. Some way that appeals to me more than the kind of like this serene unflappability of the Buddha. <coughs> and um, I, I don't know, I mean, there's some way where, where emotions make us who we are. Um, and I, I know that you can, we can act out in very self-destructive ways, but to, to negate that, I don't think honors our humanity. Yeah, but nobody's saying negate it. No. The Buddha's saying, pay it, feel, feel, know your emotions, know your, recognize them when they come up. Yeah. And, and act on them in an intelligent way. Uh, well, in a skillful way, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, right. skillful and diligent. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, Jesus turning this probably shouldn't even go there, but Jesus <laughs> overturning the money tables got him crucified. Okay. So there might have been. <laughs> he might have had choices. <laughs> Who am I to say? Who am I to say? <laughs> but so could we say that, that terrorism is justified? Well, that's a huge leap. Uh, I mean, come on. I, I'm, I'm not just. It, it is a leap. But I'm being, uh, I'm, I'm being I mean, provocative here. There, there can be compassion. But that's coming from anger, right? Yeah. And, and deep yeah, feeling and about injustice. Hardly twisted, unskillful application of anger. Unskillful application. As, as, as opposed to acting out of anger coming from compassion yeah. uh, and, and feeling like this isn't right and this needs to be right. addressed. I'm going to, damn it, I'm going to, to do something about it. So beautiful. So. Anger can go either way, and, and when anger is tempered, as you just put, with tempered with compassion and and um, discernment and and thoughtful action, it's it, it can be useful, and it can also be very destructive. Oh, yeah. What about the Boston Tea Party? Uh, up against the history, huh? <laughs> I mean, I was just saying that we were the colonists were. We were mentioning the colonists were terrorists in the eyes of the British. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they yeah. did yeah. very unconventional yeah. warfare. They wouldn't line up. They'd hide behind trees. Yeah. They'd blow up their buildings. They were horrible. Yeah. 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 Depends on what side you're on. Yeah. What side you're on is how you interpret the, the, the skillfulness of these acts. Jim, you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you believe in, in a presence of evil? I could one night in my house there was there was a spirit of such demonic indictment um, said out of self-preservation. I said, "Get out of my house!" And it seemed to leave, but it was spooky. Um, is that it? <laughs> I I don't have I don't I, you ask do I believe I don't have a belief about that I, personally when that kind of thing happens with me I don't more often than not I don't know whether it's <coughs> my own mind that's creating something or whether there's something you know yeah. in, independent of me I can't make that distinction so I don't know. I had a question, and I was I wanted to make one comment before I asked my question. Which is, uh, I'm aware that there are aspects of the Buddhist tradition that um, have images other than the Buddha that appear as completely angry. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're understood to be, um, although having all the signs of anger, expressions of pure compassion. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's a mm -hmm. big tradition, and there's a lot of different images, not just the Buddha sitting in meditation. But I also wanted to say um, that I'm curious about your. Um, so you spoke a bit about um, distinguishing skillful and unskillful mental states, and um, I, I, I'm interested in hearing you just just like talk about the ground where that kind of distinguishing becomes judging. You know, like when one becomes the other, because I think that's an area of confusion. Yeah, actually, I was talking about wholesome and unwholesome mental right. states, wholesome which could mental. result in skillful or unskillful action. Fair enough. Yeah, um, wholesome and unwholesome. But yeah, there, it takes. Like how do you it takes discernment. To, how do you describe the, experientially the difference between the judging and the distinguishing? I I would make a distinction between discernment and judging. Yeah. Because in judging. Um, D discernment has more of a compassionate quality about it, and, and a, a less um, attached. Uh -huh. You know, in, in judgment, we're almost always attached. It's like you know, that's bad, that's good. I want that. I don't want that. And so that's all attachment. Yeah. Um, but what you're describing is 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 a really interesting part of this whole investigation. It's part of the investigation is to look at what you know what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. Sometimes we might be wrong or we might you know, my wholesome might be your unwholesome. So it's um, 
So the same thing you do with Scrown. Sometimes you're judging, and sometimes you're being compassionate. And yet, very often I'm judging when I would prefer to be discerning. Okay, <laughs> that's why I'm curious. It's I like, mean, we, we so we talk, how can we talk about in a, that in a way that helps us right. helps each other do more discerning right. and less judging? Right. Actually, last time when we talked about, um, I don't know if you were here, when I, when I talked about the feeling tones, the vagueness, mm-hmm. which are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, um, we got into a discussion after, a really interesting discussion about when that becomes judging. is When, when, when I'm having a pleasant experience of something, automatically it becomes good, and then I want it, and this is, that's the road to desire. And something that I experience as unpleasant is, is, oh, I don't want that. I want that to go away. I hate it. And that's the, that's the road to, to aversion. So, especially with us Westerners, we're so prone to, to judging. That's, our minds just go to judging so fast that if, if we do nothing else in our mindfulness practice, I'd encourage you to notice, to notice when judging happens and see if you just, just notice it there. Without even necessarily saying that's bad, I have to stop it because that's a judgment, right? So do we start judging, judging? It's a, it's a judgment. Lee, you had your hand up. Yeah, sort of. Just, just a, a thought that came to mind about a way of distinguishing. If the thought that comes up along with it is, "I am right and they are wrong," "I am righteous and they are evil," you probably it generally not <laughs> it's not not good action. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And how often we do that? I do that when I read the paper. Me too. Before it. <laughs> I, I do it when I see somebody, some driver doing something that I yeah. think is wrong. Yeah. And that's it. So reading the paper, driving the car, Oof. and it, 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 Shantanu, I think your question is about, you know, what, how do we practice mindfulness? You know, we're not on the cushion. Reading the paper, driving the car. You know, all these activities are great places to practice discernment and, and uh, mindfulness. Pat? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still struggling with with indifference, as at, at least what I think is indifference. I, I mean, I get to the point in 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 some kinds of meditation where I really do feel that there's no attachment to the thoughts that are coming through, whether they're desire or fear or uh, emotional, and I can be in a in a sweet spot, if you will sometimes even joy. But, of course, it doesn't last, but what, I guess what I'm saying is as I carry it through from meditation into life, what's that feel like? I mean, I would like to be the smiling Dalai Lama. I would like to be the giggling Maharishi. You know, I would like to be more SpongeBob than Squidward. Okay. And, and I find myself kind of thinking, okay, but then that's desire, and then I get looped back into, you know, that's what I want. But I really don't know what that feeling tone would be, other well, than indifference. What are you getting stuck there? What you're describing, I think, is not indifference, but equanimity. And indifference is often described as being the near enemy of equanimity. Well, if, if it's equanimity, I mean, in meditation, I think I, I even get to the equanimity. But, but, and equanimity is the ability to be with great joy, great sorrow, disappointment, anger, um, all those things that, that that come up in our lives. A table of be with that without being completely um, overwhelmed by. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to hold the balance of time here <laughs> and say that, um, David, will you be in the lobby afterward for any additional? And we look forward to your fourth part of your series. Thank you. Next, Great discussion. Yes. Next week's uh, presenter will be someone also known, Jennifer Berzin. A unique blend of singer, songwriter, teacher, and activist. Over the course of eight albums, she has developed and explored recurring themes with a rare wisdom. Her lifelong involvement in environmental women's and other justice movements, as well as an interest in Buddhism and earth-based spirituality, is at the heart of her writing. So look forward to her next week.
Um, in order to sustain this sangha, our presenters, the programs that are the outreach programs to Larkin Street youth and the newsletter to the uh, prisoners, it takes um, finances to do that and your generosity through Donna um, really helps keep all of that going and a suggested donation for Donna is $10 and the host whoever he might be, there he is, uh, will be holding the bowl to uh, accept the Donna. Mark, host. Oh, yes, I'm the, the host. Uh, better late than never, or I realize I'm the way they can use this morning. Uh, anyway, um, there's a few refreshments. Please help yourself. Uh, if there's some hot water for tea, if you use the cups, please wash them out and put them back in the shelf in the kitchen area. Um, there was a uh, the sign up sheet on the veranda, on the veranda, on the uh, <laughs> the <dead> zone, <laughs> there. And then a bunch of us, uh, sometimes we have 12 30 about for lunch, and uh, I'll be walking away with Dumbo. Are there any really, really important burning announcements that have to be made? <laughs> Good. If not, you, you well, speak uh, them out in the lobby. <laughs> wait, wait. I've got one. Got Good. One. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. It's okay. I know Tom has been, Bruin has been um, lobbying you all to uh, take on a prisoner pen pal. Um, I have had several over the years, and if you want to have a profoundly compassionate um, relationship with somebody that you don't even know, um, sign up to be a, a, a prison pen pal. Um, you really, there's a, a waiting list, and you don't need any special skills, and it's very powerful for my own practice, so I just want to endorse it. And I'm starting to post the pen pal request letters on our Facebook page so you can read them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for a stimulating day, and let's uh, make a circle. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org. <laughs>